We are the church. We are not a place, a building, or a program. We are people driven toward leading people to find and follow Jesus. We are driven. Driven by vision. Driven by grace. Driven by worship. Driven by mission. We are the church. We are driven. Good. Tell you what, Troy Campus, if this doesn't get you excited, I don't know what will. Okay, so every time you see a baptism, you know, you need to know that someone is making that decision to follow Jesus, to, to give everything else up and come before his feet and obey them in that, in that act of baptism. So, so we, we're excited about all that's happening. One of the things that I want you to notice over there and just know, I know that uh, many of you, if you're new, you may not know this, Harvester is uh, one church in multiple locations. We have a, a campus in St. Charles, and then we have this campus here, and we celebrate all of Harvester's baptisms together, and uh, what I want you to know is that very few of those baptisms were actually done by staff or pastors uh, on staff, and what I want you to know is that we believe that disciples make disciples, and so if you're a disciple of Jesus, you can make other disciples and you can baptize them. And uh, I hope that we, you know, can see more and more of that. So, <clears throat> but we're going to start uh, today, and we start a new series called Driven. And uh, we need to understand what drives our church. And our mission is to lead people to find and follow Jesus. And we do this by making disciples uh, through relationships, so what we call in relational environments. And what we're going to dive into today is, is part of the process of being a disciple of Jesus. You've seen this painting probably in the lobby, and I took the liberty to simply take it down and bring it over here, because sometimes you need to do that in order for you to, to see the importance of why we have certain things out in the lobby. Uh, now, if you are under 18, I don't expect you to be able to read this, because it's kind of cursive, but... <laughs> For those of you, you're like, what is that? I can't understand what it says. You know, it says, explore the faith. What does that say? Explore the faith. What does that mean? What does it mean to explore the faith? And, and that's what I want to talk to you about because we say it all the time, and we even call it our four E's here at Harvester. But you know what? Unless we understand what they are, they mean nothing. Unless we as a church understand why we have this and the other paintings in our lobby on the wall, you know, it means nothing. 
I'm going to tell you what it means to explore the faith today. See, there are some things that are worth another look. They're worth looking again and double-checking and making sure they're worth another look. I'm going to tell you a few things that are worth another look, and I'm going to just dis- give you a disclaimer. This pastor that's preaching in front of you has never had anything to do with these things, okay? Well, maybe. We'll see. Checking when you water your grass and you're getting ready to go to be- bed is worth another look. Checking to make sure that the water is off. Otherwise, you may end up watering your grass the whole night, and you wake up to a flood next morning in the basement or maybe on the street. That's just, again, a hypothetical instance. Now that that's ever happened to this pastor right here. You know, <clears throat> it is worth checking the thermostat before you leave town to make sure you can maybe save a little bit. If it's the winter time, you bring it down and press hold. It's worth another look, you know, to look at that thermostat to make sure that you can save a little bit. It's worth checking for light posts as you're getting ready to make a right turn to make sure you don't make too sharp of a turn and scrape the side of your vehicle, okay? It's worth also making sure, and this is like for those of you animal lovers, you know, close your ears, make sure there are no kittens underneath your vehicle. It's worth another look when you have little animals to make sure you don't scare anyone. See, Christian faith is an ongoing exploration of Jesus. It is an ongoing looking back. You have to, it's worth another look because we believe that Jesus is worth another look. So when we talk about exploring our faith, what we're saying is that a disciple of Jesus always takes another look at Jesus. Always. Now, here's the difficulty that many of us, I, I assume that we can have people here, and whether this is your first time or you were a part of the worship band, uh, even myself included, maybe you are an elder or a pastor, or maybe you've been a Christian for a long time. The temptation is to be familiar with Jesus and forget to take another look at him. There is a difference between being familiar and, and continue to explore Jesus and know him personally. Many of us are familiar with Jesus, in fact. But being familiar with Jesus can actually stop you from, know, from knowing him better. Being familiar with Jesus can actually uh, be detrimental to your relationship with God. And I'm going to tell you what the problem of familiarity is and what it causes, how it causes you to overlook Jesus. There's a problem uh, of familiarity and overlooking Jesus. And, and to do this, I'm going to tell you a story. And all I want you to do as you listen to the story is I want you to picture what this would look like. And then I'm going to ask you, there are several characters in this story. I'm going to ask you to think, which character do I relate with the most? That's all I'm going to ask you to do. So just listen to the story, picture what's happening, picture this scene, and then think, which of these characters, of all of them, do I relate with the most? The story goes like this. That Jesus was invited by one of the Pharisees, probably the lead Pharisee in this town. A Pharisee was a religious leader. And this religious leader threw a dinner party for Jesus. And Jesus went to be with them. And as he was reclining at the table, um, he, you know, just, uh, there was this woman. And as she walked through the doors, thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. Um, that was not part of the story, by the way. We left in the woman. Okay, as the woman walked in the door, looks were just locked on her. She had lived a sinful life, but she had learned that Jesus was at this Pharisee's house, and so she wanted to see him, and she stood behind him with an alabaster, uh, just full jar of perfume, full of oil with perfume. As she stood behind Jesus, she began to weep so much that she began began, uh, just washing his feet, with her tears and wiping her feet, his feet with, with her hair, kissing him uh, on his feet and pouring the perfume on, on him. Now, when the Pharisee looked at this woman and what she was doing to Jesus and the fact that Jesus was allowing her to do this, he thought to himself, this man cannot be a prophet. If he knew who this woman you know, was, uh, is, that she is a sinner, he would not let her do so. 
Jesus, knowing his heart, responded, Simon, I have something to tell you. And so Simon said, tell me, teacher. And he tells him this story about two people who owed money to a money lender. One owed him about 20 months' worth of wages, and the other one owed him uh, two months' worth of wages. However, neither of them had the money to pay. And so the money lender actually forgave both of their debts. And so the question that Jesus asked Simon was, now which of them will love the money lender more? Simon replied, I suppose the one that owed him more. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman that was washing his feet and, and wiping them with her hair. And he said, do you see this woman? I came into your house and you didn't give me water for my feet. Yet she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman has not stopped kissing my feet since the moment I entered this house. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you that her sins have been forgiven as, she, as her great uh, love has shown. But whoever has, forgiven, has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven as, as Jesus said these words, all the other guests in the house among, said among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? But Jesus turned around and said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I'll tell you what, this is a story that whether you're new or you've been a Christian for a long time, should really speak to you. The question, and you don't have to answer it, but just keep it in the back of your mind. Who do you relate with the most? Because there are two main characters, and then we're going to look at a third one, uh, a third set of characters. But there are two main characters in this. And the first one represents the, how familiar we can become with Jesus, that we actually overlook him. See, Simon, let's talk about Simon first, this Pharisee, this religious leader. He was so uh, just... Uh, acquainted with God he knew the Old Testament scriptures he knew there was a Messiah to come he, he knew all the stipulations and the liturgy that took you know to, to serve and worship God he knew all the rituals and all the traditions and and he missed Jesus even though he had him over for dinner see familiarity with Jesus makes you part of the status quo Familiarity with Jesus makes you part of the status quo. Uh, let's go back to, to verse 30, uh, 36 of Luke 7. Actually, this story is found in Luke chapter 7. And I want to just read to you this first part of the verse. And it says that when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with them, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. I'm going to show you a picture of what sometimes we think this dinner looked like. And, uh, you know, I always love how, you know, we tend to look at the gospel with our set of eyes. So whoever painted this picture did not get it right. You know, this is a regular looking table with regular looking chairs. Uh, and I want to, what is the artifact that's behind Jesus? Is that a fan or what? I'm like, that almost looks like a fan. Jesus had a fan in the first century. That's just a halo, I think. Whoever was painting that, that's a halo. But that is the picture that many times we get in our heads. You see, you know, this woman, you know, carefully pouring perfume over Jesus' feet. And you see everybody just kind of standing around. That's not a picture that this passage gives us. In fact, the Bible says that Simon invited Jesus. But we don't know. As you read this story, as you think through this story, I don't think that Simon invited Jesus because he knew who, who Jesus was. He invited him. Because that's what people did. That's what the lead Pharisee was supposed to do. He was supposed to invite whatever traveling teacher or prophet was around. That was his obligation. That was his duty. And so he just did so. Now, when you look at, uh, at doing that, the, the Pharisee was expected to invite him. And I tell you what, many times when we're familiar with Jesus, we just become part of the status quo. We just do what we're supposed to do. I don't know how many of you are here this morning because that's just what's supposed to be done. We just get up and as a family we go to church. You just want to please someone and maybe you just wanted to come to church with them. 
You just become part of the status quo. Uh, when I was in high school, I think my freshman year of high school, it has to be 90, 98 or 99, um, I really became infatuated with uh, the Nikes Air Jordans. These shoes, the shoes. You know, everybody was ha- you know, had these, and I just wanted a pair, and I just, you know, everybody loved them and talked about how cool they were. They were, like, sensational, right? And so I'm like, I want a pair. I mean, here was the problem. My family at the time... Uh, my dad had, had a, you know, a series of just uh, bad job, jobs that he had found himself in, and, and so we didn't have the money to. So here's what uh, you can find if you grow up in Mexico City. There are places that can sell you shoes that look just like Nikes, that say the same Air Jordan, that have the same logo just as Nike, except they're not actual Nikes. They were probably made somewhere in China or Indonesia or somewhere. And they're much cheaper, right? Now, if you look closely, you can tell the difference. But from far away, you can't tell. So my mom just bought me these shoes, shoes and I, at first I thought, oh, that's cool. You know, I can fool my friends into thinking that I have Nike Air Jordans. But you know what you end up with? You end up being afraid of actually showing your friends and letting them take a close look because you're afraid. What if they find out that I have a cheap, pair of, you know, imitation, you know, just uh, shoes instead of the real ones. You know what? I think people that are familiar with Jesus and that we just want to be part of the status quo, like we just want to go with it. We want to do, you know, do the Jesus thing because that's what everybody else is doing. If you ask in our society, how many of you are Christians? 73% of them will say they are, but I want to know how many of them are simply familiar with Jesus. And you need to ask yourself that same question. Do I have a cheap imitation of Jesus, or do I know the real deal? Am I vaguely familiar with who he is, or do I truly know him? Familiarity with Jesus makes you part of the status quo. Uh, Number two, familiarity with Jesus is not the same as knowing Jesus. Being familiar with Jesus is not the same as knowing him. Look at verse 39. So there's this guy that just goes along with what he's supposed to do, right? The church saying he invites Jesus over. Yet, uh, verse 39, he says, When the Pharisee who had invited him saw that this woman was around Jesus, right? Saw him. He said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Listen to to the words of Simon. Listen to the thinking. Actually, he was thinking to himself these things. Simon was unimpressed with Jesus. And the question is why? Why was Simon unimpressed with with Jesus? Uh, Did he think he was a prophet? Did he think he was a false teacher? Did he think that Jesus was trying to, you know, come up with this new belief that was wrong? We don't exactly know. But we know is that he missed it. And the way that Luke writes this. It's like the author, the writer, Luke, uh, that wrote this gospel. He wants you to be in this belief. He wants you to be like, how did he miss him? How did he miss being Jesus? You know, many times we think, oh, if God appeared to me, if God appeared to me, I would not miss him. I tell you what, you need to be careful when you think about that. If you think, if God just showed himself to me, if God just answered this prayer, I would be faithful. If that's how you think, you're in grave danger. You're just vaguely familiar with, with God and with Jesus. Here's why. Because we see over and over again in Scripture that people not only knew him or saw him or listened to him, they ate. They invited him over to dinner, yet they didn't know who Jesus was. They couldn't recognize him. And sometimes we, we like to think that we're smarter than the people from Scripture. I'm going to tell you, I don't think we are. I think if you are not careful, we could have Jesus standing in front of us. And I believe many of us, really have God working in your life in front of you and we miss him because we're vaguely familiar with him we think we got it oh I got it I know the story yeah I've read the Bible since I was little I've got this and because you are familiar with him you actually miss him familiarity with Jesus is not the same as knowing Jesus familiarity with Jesus is more dangerous than not knowing Jesus at all in fact, I believe that being familiar with Jesus is more dangerous than not knowing him at all. In verses 40 through 47, Jesus does some stern teaching to this, this man named Simon. He gives him this illustration of this money lender. And he says, you know, there were two men that owed this money lender, you know, some money. One owed him 20 months worth of salary. 
500 denarii was about 20 months worth of salary, and the other one owed him two months worth of salary. And I'll tell you what, here is what he was trying to get across. What Simon missed by, by, by not really knowing Jesus is that he really didn't think that he was someone that owed God anything or that owed Jesus anyone, anything. I don't, I don't care if it's 20 months or two months worth of salary. If you owed someone and you don't pay, you're probably going to end up in jail. Or you're going to end up with your stuff taken away. Because it doesn't matter the amount. When you owed something, you must pay. And I tell you what, many of us people that are familiar with Jesus, like Simon did, we are in danger of, of believing that there is no debt at all or that we were never in debt. If you've been a Christian and you've paid, your sins have been forgiven, your debt has been paid, you may be in danger of forgetting that you were in debt at some point and remembering the one who forgave you everything. And, and I'll tell you what, look at his response when Jesus gives him this application. Verse 43, Simon replies, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt. Jesus is like, who would love this money lender more? The one who owed him two months worth of wages or 20 months? And, and Simon almost is annoyed. You know, I just, I just wish I could, you know, listen to Simon replying to Jesus. But he's like, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. Many times our attitudes can be that, you know, that, that we just don't want to hear it even if it's coming from God, we don't want to hear truth. I don't know if you at times feel like, you know, God is a burden to you. Like he asks so many things of you that he maybe his word is like, I don't understand half of it. Why do I have to read it? Why do I have to go to church? I'm giving up my morning. You know, and I'll tell you what, if your attitude isn't right, if you don't understand that you're, you actually owed God so much, don't be here. I'm, you're wasting your time. He doesn't even want you here. And I know it sounds counterintuitive, but he wants people that understand. See, that's the contrast that we're going to make. Simon, who knew so much about the Lord, but about God and scriptures, was vaguely familiar with them in reality. And there was someone else who actually got it. And it was a prostitute. It was a woman who was considered a sinner. And I want you to think, which one am I? So let's go to the other side. Let's explore the virtue of exploring Jesus, of exploring our faith daily. There's a virtue in that. First, the first uh, you know, part of it I want to say is that exploring Jesus daily leads you to break the status quo. Exploring Jesus daily leads you to break the status quo. Uh, let's read verse 37 and 38 because I think this is just outstanding. Uh, it says that a woman, this woman that we've been talking about in that town who lived a sinful life, Learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. We don't exactly know where, you know, the town that Jesus was in. The Bible is not specific. Most scholars, if you read the passages before and the passages after... You know, see that it was probably a, a small town that Jesus was in. And there was this woman that decided to risk rejection because she knew that Jesus was different. She thought and had faith that Jesus could forgive her sins. And maybe she had asked for forgiveness and she just needed a reassurance. And so she shows up. Can you imagine in a small town where everybody knew what she did in her showing up? into the house of the lead Pharisee. You know, imagine, I want you to picture how does she feel? You know, walking in, how nervous she must have been just going into that house and receiving looks. Looks from people that maybe looked at her on the street and, and just judged her. Looks from maybe people that actually had been her customers. Looks from people that, you know, just always considered her, her the lowest of the low. Yet she risked rejection because she wanted to find out more about this Jesus guy. By the way, I want you to know and think about this always. And I want us to always remember as a campus and as a church at Harvester, what do you think people are feeling sometimes when they're walking through the doors? Remember 
that the first time you walk through the doors of a church, and I want you to hope, I hope that you are part of the solution that always welcomes people, that you're not like these Pharisees that maybe looked at her and looked away, that maybe looked at her and, and just looked her, you know, up and down and then just kept going, that you're not one of those that just, just keeps people at, you know, at a distance, but that you welcome people regardless of their background, regardless of who they are. But anyway, let's keep going with this story. The woman brought an alabaster uh, jar just full of perfume. And I tell you what, it's outstanding that she brought the same substance that she used to seduce men before the feet of Jesus. And then, so exploring Jesus daily leads you to break the status quo. You're not going to care anymore about just keeping up with the things that you're supposed to do. When you actually know Jesus, he's going to lead you to do way more than that. And and it's not going to be a burden. It's going to be something that you want to do because when you get to see him, everything changes. Which leads us to the next point. Exploring Jesus daily leads you to his feet. Exploring Jesus daily leads you to his feet. The beginning part of verse 38 tells you about this. Here's a picture of maybe how Jesus was reclining at the table. It's very different than... What we do today when we think of dinner at a table, right? So we think of sitting in front of the table. They were laying on the table. So if, you have, if there are little kids in here and you're told not to eat at the couch, you say, Jesus did it. Why can't I do it? Okay? There were couches like, you know, these cushions around these really short tables. And people would just lean on their elbow. Now, I have bad shoulders, so that would not work for me. So praise the Lord for 20th century tables. Um, but that's the way that it would have been. So how did the woman come at, she probably went behind Jesus. And that's why it says right here, verse 38, as she stood behind him at his feet weeping. I don't know how many times uh, you've been reminded of who you truly are by God. I don't know how many of you have ever read scripture and there's been some truths that hit you just hard that it makes you break down. The Bible says that the word of God is like a sword that pierces through every layer and goes into the heart. And if you haven't been pierced like that, I'm going to encourage you to keep seeking God honestly and sincerely and constantly. Because when you get to that point, something is going to happen and he's going to break a layer of pride that may be within you. And that's exactly what happened to this woman. She's sitting behind him and just seeing Jesus, she starts breaking down, she starts weeping. Weeping and control, uncontrollably so much that she thinks the tears are, there are enough tears to wet his feet. She thinks and feels like she has to clean them and wipe them with her hair. Um, there's a, a guy named Harold Begbie that uh, tells the story of this set of missionaries in London that went on the streets of Lon- to the streets of London and they were, went basically to find prostitutes and here's what they would give. They would invite them for a nice meal and at the end of the meal they would give them a white flower and they tell the story of this one you know uh, woman that was given this white flower and as she received the white flower she just started saying you know what I used to be like this white flower and as she thought of who she was and just the darkness of you know that that this uh, habit was taking her to she just began to weep and she broke down in front of them and there are little things that remind you sometimes of who we truly are and God's word tends to do that for us and so you need to get in it because when you see who you truly are and who God is you are going to break down and you're going to go to his feet and we need to be and remain in that place on a regular basis as Christians we need to be at the feet of Jesus because we're seeing ourselves compared to him Stop looking around. I'm better than that person. I'm better than that guy. And my family is better than the family, you know, next door. And start comparing yourself to Jesus. And when you're in front of him or behind him or around him, you're going to see yourself, man, and you're going to break down. And that's a good place to be. Because that's where forgiveness exists. Exploring Jesus daily leads you to saving faith. Listen to the words of Jesus that we all want to hear so desperately. This woman needed to hear these words and people were judging her. People were, uh, you know, just despising Jesus and her. And in fact, Jesus says the opposite and says like, Simon, you missed it all. You missed it all. And this woman, 
actually got it right. And in verse 48 says, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? But Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I don't think the woman woke up that day thinking, I'm going to go and rob a religious dinner and party. I'm going to, you know, just disrupt everything by weeping uncontrollably behind Jesus and wipe his feet with my hair and pour the perfume that I used to seduce other men. I don't think she woke up that morning thinking that she was going to do all that. But I also don't think that she knew that she was going to acquire a peace that she had never felt before. A peace, the peace of forgiveness. And it goes just right along, this passage goes right along with what Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 says. You don't have to look it up, I'll read it for you. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. In accordance with the riches of God's grace. And then the same thing in Ephesians 2.8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God. This woman found herself in a very unlikely place. But found herself with a peace that no one else could give her except the Lord Jesus. Now let me go back to that question as we finish. Which of the characters do you relate with the most? Are you vaguely familiar with Jesus? Like some, Maybe you grew up in church. Maybe you are that one person that, you know, is like, I got it. I've been a Christian for a long time. And sometimes you just do the church thing because that's what you do. And if that's the case, I'm going to, in brotherly love, you know, and in the Lord, I'm going to encourage you. You need to repent and you need to go back to exploring Jesus like this woman so desperately. So animate about just being at his feet each and every day. You need to wake up and say, God, how can I know you more? Jesus, how can I know you a little bit more today? Can you show me a little bit more of who I really am so that I will not be okay with just being okay? You need to lay Jesus into your life. So maybe you relate with Simon the Pharisee. Maybe you relate with the woman. Maybe you are burdened by sin. Maybe there is something in your life and you just, you know, at times weep before the Lord and say, God, forgive me. And if that's you, I want to tell you, if you're honest, God is going to say, and Jesus is telling you, yes, I'm here. Your sins are forgiven. Maybe you are, here's the third set of characters. There were a bunch of guests. And you know what? Exploring Jesus will cause you to ask the question, who is this? We see there in verse 49, the other guests begin to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Maybe you are that person. Maybe you are the guy, the, the, the gal that, you know, it's like you just don't really know who Jesus is. And maybe you're just standing there seeing other people come to God and get forgiveness and get their lives transformed. You're seeing some religious people miss Jesus completely altogether. And you are in the middle of it all. You're looking one, looking at the other. And you're like, who is this Jesus? And, and can I trust him? Is this for real? You know, if you look at Simon, you're going to think Jesus is a false prophet. You look at religious people, you're going to think Jesus is not for real in our culture. But then if you look at the woman, you're going to see, man, how could she do that? He must be for real. And you're going to see the peace and the forgiveness. And you think, can God really, can Jesus really offer that for me? And you're thinking, who is this? Whether you are, if you are Simon, you need to come before God. You know, one thing that I think is interesting, Luke never tells us was how Simon reacted. Did he repent? Did he not repent? Did he kick Jesus out after all this happened? Was he just, you know, back in the corner, taken back by the words and the response of Jesus? We don't know. I tell you what he should have done. He should have repented and said, Lord, I'm sorry I missed you even though you were dining with me at my house. If you can do that today, you can just say, Lord, I'm sorry if I missed you because I thought I was familiar with you and I didn't really know you. Maybe you're the woman. And if you're the woman, I tell you, keep coming to the feet of Jesus. Maybe you are the other guests and you're asking, who is this? I'm going to tell you, you keep exploring your faith each and every day. 
you're going to find a Lord and a Savior that will not disappoint you. So I'm going to invite you to, to we're going to pray, and then I'm going to invite you to stand up. And if you have not given your, your life to Jesus, I'm going to tell you exactly what we can do. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, thank you so much for who you are. I pray, Lord, that we never become so familiar with you that we miss you. I pray that you'll help us be like this woman that desperately sought after you and that uh, didn't care about what others thought, that uh, simply came to your feet and at your feet, Lord, and, and he, she showed the love that she had for you because you had forgiven her. Um, I pray that we become those grateful, forgiven people that always welcome and let others close to your feet. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, if you're still watching, we just want to thank you for uh, coming by and just watching this message. And I just want to share real fast uh, the reason why Harvester uh, does this is because uh, we believe that uh, you know people need to hear about the Lord Jesus. Uh, it is our mission to lead people to find and follow Him. And so I just want to encourage you, if you have not received Jesus uh, in your life uh, ever, I just want you to listen to these words in John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but, to, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. So if you uh, have never received Jesus into your life, I, I encourage you, investigate. Take some time. This is the most important decision that you could ever make. And so what we're going to do is we're going to show you right here at the bottom of the screen, just our website. You can always go to harvesterchristian.org and find out a little more about our church. And if you don't live locally, then I just invite you find a church that you call home that believes in the Bible as the Word of God and just start worshiping, start learning more about who our Lord is. Um, I hope you have a great day and uh, thanks for watching.